All right, so we got a special show planned today. Uh, I wanted to bring the Lord of Lore, Mr. Astropub, the Astropub, as you many of you probably know on YouTube, on Twitch. If you don't, go follow him, go subscribe. But today I have brought him in to help me explore the verse a little bit. So I thought we could sit down for about an hour or so and visit some of the star systems in Star Citizen. Some of them obviously not in game, but we'll, we'll start with ones that we know. And just kind of talk about some of the interesting lore surrounding it, the planets, maybe a interesting bit or two uh, that's happened in those planets or those systems, and just kind of have a pretty chill kickback, talk about this kind of stuff. So let's start with somewhere we all know, uh, Stanton. Now I've got, I've got all the things here. I've got like, whoops, I'm in the wrong browser. All right, so I've got like the, uh, the wiki, Galactopedia if we need it and the map. If anybody doesn't know, this is the star map on the actual RSI website, and it basically lets you see what's in the game. But, uh, Paul, tell me about Stanton. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll go through some basics, and I'll tell you some things that you won't be able to find on the wiki unless you go through, through some digging. Okay. Uh, stuff that I've learned about Stanton, which is pretty cool. But um, Stanton itself is a very unusual system. It is a system that has four... Uh, super Earths, which for those of you who don't know, it means that it's an, it's double the size of Earth or bigger than Earth. And all of those Super Earths have some level of habitability, even Crusader. Now, I don't know if it's 100% confirmed that Crusader is 100% like breathable naturally. The fact that it has uh, space whales in it, the, the, uh, uh, I always forget their name. I always want to say narwhals, but it's not it. It's uh, storm walls. Yeah, storm uh, walls. The fact that it has storm walls in it is actually uh, evidence that it probably didn't have any uh, terraforming, because if it had terraforming, then those storm walls would be dead. <laughs> so every single planet in in uh, in um, this system had some form of livability, habitability, uh, either required a little bit of uh, terraformation or none at all. Um, we know that like Microtech, for instance, famously got screwed up, so it became too cold. Um, but the, the actual funny story about Stanton is that it's fairly recent. It's only been around for maybe 100 years. And when the UEE found it, they weren't the first ones there. Humans had been living in Stanton for an unusual amount of time beforehand. And prospectors, smugglers, pirates, people who were living off the grid, which is not unusual. There's a lot of systems that were discovered and settled before they were officially discovered. Um, and uh, so they had to kind of, the UE had to kick out uh, kick out these po folks. Um, but after they removed those people, the first people to actually settle at Stanton was the UEE Navy. So um, because of the viability of these four planets, which is they're great for terraformation, and on top of that, they found a jump point that goes to Terra, meaning that Stanton became the hub of trade between Sol and Terra. It's only like four or five jumps between the two because of Stanton. Stanton is, is uh, in many ways, like New York City, you know, or, or, or Amsterdam or Tokyo. Uh, Sounds it fun. Is, it is, it's like the, the hub of commerce in, in, in the verse. So, is, uh, so this has always been like the, the thing that stood out to me. Um, or I guess the thing that gets brought up all the time is like you mentioned that it's such a young system Yet you've got like a whole planet covered by a city. Oh, yeah How so how? <laughs> the easiest answer is capitalism um, Fair so, so in if the there's process, one way to get it done <laughs> In the process of negotiating for this uh, it requires a little bit of a backstory effectively Stanton, even though the UE Navy had settled it, they had nothing to do. It was just, they, they knew they had to keep it because it was tactically viable and important for commerce. But it was right in the middle of one of the worst economic slumps the empire had ever seen. During the last measure, uh, the, the, over the overthrow of the last measure. Hold on, I got some pretty slumpy looking pictures here. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, the... Uh, during the last, 
measure, after they, they overthrew the last measure. It was a revolution. It was messy. It was chaotic. And a lot of companies were tied that were tied to the measures just collapsed. People ran away because they didn't want to get, uh, you know, strung up for war crimes and crimes against humanity and other people like just just disappeared. Uh, other people were, were, were caught and tried. It was not a pretty kind of uh, end to the whole regime. And as a result, there were pretty much no company except for RSI and Aegis really survived that that purge and and, and uh, Argo really survived that purge and Aegis and RSI almost collapsed because they were also super tied to the Messers. So we're talking like mid 29th century. There are no ship manufacturers left. In fact, all of the modern ship manufacturers we have and a lot of the modern like companies come from this time period to fill in that void that was left uh, by um, by these companies collapsing. To give you a, some context for this, they were using military surplus Idrises as cargo ships. <laughs> I mean, they got a lot of they space. Were, <laughs> they ran out of out of ships. The, like the the companies that made these the older cargo ships just don't exist anymore, and that means that the parts manufacturers don't exist anymore, so they can't replace any parts that break. There's no new ships coming out from them. Uh, so you can imagine trying to convince people, hey, come out to these planets which are rough and tumble on the frontier that haven't been developed and settle when we don't even have supply chains that works. <laughs> it's so, a bit of a risk. Yeah. So Stanton was like, nobody wanted to settle in Stanton because no one knew where their next, you know, if, if the if the shipments for like food would come in on time. Right. Yeah. Um, let alone, you know, actual presenting out there. So which judging by the economy that we currently play in still might be in question because <laughs> everything true. seems to always be out of stock. <laughs> um, so the UE didn't know what to do with it. it. They were just draining money because they had a, they stuck a military base on what is today Orson. Yeah. Um, and art Corp came to the rescue. Art Corp. Oh, I didn't... Was... Wow, yeah. that was loud. <laughs> um, Arcorp built a... Um, there's a long story with Arcorp. They started out as an exploration company, then became a terraformation company, then became a mining company, then became both, then became an engine manufacturer. Very long line. They effectively bought this company called Arclight, which made these really experimental reactors, and those reactors ended up becoming the like basis for all modern uh, power plants in ships today. Okay. So they 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 struck it rich a couple of times, but that is their they became their big claim to fame. The problem about about that it was that making these reactors was dirty. It was dangerous. It would kill people, and they couldn't meet with demand. Remember. Nothing was going right. Like, yeah. to give you another context of how bad this is, Crusader exists today as it is because uh, shipments were not getting where they were. So they just said, screw it, we're doing it ourselves and built a ship to ship all of their, their stuff. That's that's how they got into the shipping industry. Oh. <laughs> the Jupiter is because because of this cargo crisis okay. that's happening. Okay. So, so our corp was like, we need more space. We need we need a place to build these. So they, they, they came to the UE and asked, hey, can we buy like a continent in Stanton? Just, just a continent <laughs> uh, on one of the planets. And, uh, you know, just, just a little. And uh, can't jump UE in for a whole like, planet now. <laughs> yeah. The UE said it makes a counter offer and said, hey, we'll, we'll give you an entire planet if you uh, 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 if you help us out. And effectively what they did was they made a deal where st the these companies would pay enormous sums of money to the government for the rights to own these planets. And Art Corp built, uh, bought the planet just so that they could effectively, like the entire equator of Art Corp is, is just fusion factories. They're just factories that build fusion power plants. It's actually really and, cool. Yeah, and they didn't really need anything else than that. Like that was all the only thing they needed it for. So unlike Hurston, which was like, we're going to use this planet to test our antimatter bombs and other crazy weaponry. 
and Crusader that just wanted a, a you know a place where they could build big ships uh, in without having to go zero G and Microtech which wanted the cold because it's processing better. Right. Uh, our corp really literally had nef nothing to do with the rest of its planet. So what they did was they just sold it. So th what happened was is that all of our corp, all of the areas of our corp are all owned collectively by hundreds, thousands, millions of all of other smaller companies. Including you can see them all, all, all over here, right there. Yeah, it's a company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, they're they're the they're including Gemini. Gemini Weapons is actually headquartered on on our court. Ah, that's cool. Yeah. So so basically, because they just sold it piecemeal to all these different companies, they these companies just started developing their own little sections, and eventually they just kind of grew and grew and grew and began to work because they had almost no laws. Uh, that restricted their environmental usage or anything else like that. So it just became a good idea. Um, and they encouraged, you know, our corp was obviously encouraging this because I don't think they ever sold the land. I think they just leased the land. So they make money off of everyone. They, they make, make everyone pay rent. Dang, so. they make bank. <laughs> they make yeah. so much on rent. <laughs> oh, oh, our corp is insanely rich. Holy like, crap. Just a whole um, planet of <laughs> rent. That, that's on top of them making, you know, having the patent on effectively like the internal combustion engine. Jesus. Um, <laughs> Gosh, so. you need to stop buying from the from the man at our corp. Good Lord, they must own so much. All of the, the, the companies that own all of the planets in standard. For those of you who don't know, all of the company, all the planets are owned by individual companies. And um, all of those companies are filthy rich like hurston makes al almost all of the uh torpedoes and missiles for the navy and they build the only uh uh the equivalent of of hydrogen bombs antimatter bombs like weapons mass destruction they build they're one if not the only p um company that builds weapons mass destruction the, the antimatter bombs for the for the navy um microtech literally invented the smartwatch <laughs> <laughs> so they, they invented smartphones for the future and of course, Crusader uh, is like the backbone of, of the shipping industry these days and, uh, you know, things like that. So, well, Cataclysm, that Cataclysm in chat is asking what's the nicest planet to live on. A microtech. Yeah, better than Orison. Orison, Orison would probably be, but like. Get that fresh, is, ah, thin, thin air, you know, fresh, fresh thin air. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, microtech probably has better accommodations but orison's be more beautiful it, it's it's a tourist yeah. location yeah i mean it, it's effectively like with orison it'd be like living in paris or like uh san francisco or you know any any place that is typically a place where you'd see people you know like venice it's like living in venice yeah you know you, you, people who live in venice probably don't see it the same way that visitors come see it you know they definitely like this older concept art that they had for for orison is just much like a much different vibe than what we have now. This looks a lot more industrial. Oh, yeah. Way more industrial. This is an I mean, old concept, concept art. Sorry? Yeah, that was the original. That was the original concept. Was yeah. Very industrial. Yeah. Um, but they also lean into the to the uh, the whole aesthetic of uh, tourism because that was that became an un unintentional like side effect is that people wanted to come to to Orison. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> like, we built a city in the clouds. I can't believe people want to come see it. Huh. And then so. New Babbage has got its own look. I like them both. Mm -hmm. All right. So the Stanton system, there's so much opportunity for like, you start talking about the companies and how rich they are. And there's just so much opportunity for good story. You could have a whole video game series in just this one star system. Heck, you could have an entire video game series just in Arc Corp yeah fair yeah that's basically yeah. like star wars 1313 that's what i wanted it to be yeah uh, and and it's important to remember that none of this stuff is finished like cig has even said that they want to kind of expand out on this and there's a lot of lore behind a lot of this and i saw someone in chat being like this is really just sounds like a dystopian nightmare it's like yeah it, <laughs> yeah, it, is. it sucks <laughs> it, it's kind of the point like if anybody who goes like oh they get really cyberpunk vibes from like hurston or from like our corp, like yeah, you're supposed to, because mm -hmm. it's not supposed to be a good place. Yeah. It's supposed to be, you're supposed to be impressed by the vistas, but it's 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 heavily inspired by Blade Runner and Aliens. Yeah, so. and 
I really, really do hope that they get into the darker bits of that. Maybe, you know, once once we're not all forced to be there and they can expand yeah. a little bit on it. Um, they've they've mentioned that they want to do more kind of wilderness and actual biomes on Arcorp, right? Yeah. yeah. They want to do more more stuff on Arcorp, like like water and everything like that and uh, sort of thing. I look forward to that. All right. Let's uh let's see. Let's find another system sure. to go to. We can go pyro next. I got I got oh, yeah. go pyro because that's the next one coming. Of out. course. Actually, no. We'll go it. We'll go through the cool way. The way we'll be going through in game. Through the jump point. There we go. All right. The sphincter of the universe. <laughs> sphincter sounds. Okay, so pyro, way so pyro, bigger. It's way bigger. It's about three times the size, and mm -hmm. it's actually older in terms of the discovery. It was discovered back during the uh, during the Mesa era. Um, the problem was, uh, I believe it was uh, by it was discovered by like Pyro Logistics or something like that. I don't remember the exact name, but it was a, a separate company that discovered it, and uh, they always had plans to develop it, but never really did. Uh, they even built a space station to help kind of develop one of the, the outer systems. Uh, because the thing about Pyro is that it is um, it is very much a py pyrotechnic uh, uh, amalgamations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, is that it's filled with resources. There's just tons of resources. Old lore said everything was mined out. New lore says there's tons of resources that oh, you just okay. couldn't really tap <laughs> because dangerous planet. Or dangerous star. The star isn't. It's not going supernova or like uh, anything like that. It just sends out a lot of radiation. Um, so it's very dangerous to live in some of these some of these places uh, unless you have shelter and other things. And most of the planets aren't very hospitable, but they're livable. So uh, over time, eventually they just kind of abandoned Pyro because it just couldn't make it work. And just like anywhere in the star system universe, when you abandon a place you get uh, other people show up. and this, Other this being, people? Well, it's important to remember that like when this was discovered and around the same time it was abandoned, you're dealing with uh, a, a, a government in the UEE that was very tyrannical, reaching the peak of its absolute tyranny and power. So people, just the average person, are running away from that. And Pyro is a place that's dangerous but it's so dangerous that the ue doesn't bother going there so why don't you go there as well but the same you know pirates outlaws uh, smugglers other people who also want to avoid the law are there as well so while we like to think of pyro as this like apocalyptic like mad max esque like gangs fighting it out there are people who live there too because they just needed to escape so uh that's actually um one of those things that the whole apocalyptic thing, the recent feature that came onto the progress tracker that they were talking about was the like the flares that come out from the star that are supposed to damage everything in its path. That sound that seems pretty intense. Like, how do yeah. you how do you live in a star system? That's just is it supposed to be something that's happening daily or is this, do you it's, know, it's, in, it's infrequent, but it happens. OK, it's, OK, so it it's like an emergency. Frequent. Think of it kind of like living in California and having earthquakes. Uh. <laughs> As you and I both live in, lived in California, we kind of get the idea, you know, you you kind of, it's always there. It's yeah. omnipresent, but okay. it's like, there's, there, there, there are good days and bad days. You know, there's, ah, it's a three-pointer. And okay, let's get into the... Right. Let's get, get away from the windows to make sure we don't die. <laughs> the gigantic solar burst coming. So do yeah. you, do you have a favorite place in this system pyro 3 is my favorite yeah uh, i do like i think it's pyro 4 and pyro 3 um there's 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 one of the planets is actually orbiting um the gas giant right yeah of, of let's pyro. see because it's uh like one of the one of the uh, planets blew up <laughs> and yeah. it's not just debris fields there it is and it knocked one of the uh one of the the planets into orbit of of the uh, gas giant and it's slowly decaying its orbit so eventually the planet is going to go into the gas giant or is is it two Pyro it's, it's either the gas giant or there's two two planets are going into each other yeah looks like it's four around five yeah 
and plus there's also moons around five. So, so the like, view from four must be incredible. Can you? They haven't shown yeah. us what that's going to look like yet. I bet that's going to be incredible to see, though. Yeah. Huh. Bleak Pirate Four is where, where the where the Homestead demo was, or like the 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 demo from CitizenCon was. So. Um, uh, I think that one is Pyro Three, the yellow one. The Pyro Three. Yeah, yeah, here. Okay, cool. Well, Pyro's fun, but we keep hearing about it this year. Yeah. So let's back up and go somewhere new. In fact, let's skip. Let's skip across Nyx. I'm thinking. About Castra? Cathcart or Castra? Cathcart. Let's talk about Cathcart. All right. And Cathcart. Ooh. Yeah. Spider. Cotton candy ball. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. So uh, fun th thing about Cathcart is that it doesn't really have any planets, really, if I remember correctly. It's It's got uh, uh, what is effectively... It was a, it was used as a place where the UE Navy would mothball its fleet. So old UE Navy, um, like cruisers, destroyers, battleships, that were still usable, but not in service they would just park them in orbit around uh, Cathcart because it was like at a very stable place that no one really went to. But they, over time, they just kind of forgot that they were there and like those ships became less and less advanced, you know, as time went, al went along. And so eventually pirates came in and uh, outlaws. As they do. The, uh, as they do. Basically, if the UE ignores some place, it can almost guarantee you some outlaws will be there because it's... <laughs> It's just with the nature of it. Any, any, all of the cracks that are left behind with the UE, you'll see outlaws. Uh, and they, they, they took these old wrecks and they literally just kind of welded them together into a giant floating space station of just old battleships and destroyers. And, and then they constantly bring in new ships that they capture, like pirates will bring in new ships and they'll add it to the, to the, to the hull. Um, it's a full on functioning pirate society. It's, it's, it's Tortuga from the, um, uh, the 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 Pirates of the Caribbean. It's Port Royal in uh, Jamaica. And it's... honestly, if it looked like this in game, I don't see how it could. But <laughs> if it did, that would be insane. I, I don't doubt it. I think it'll look something like that, or with like various little like shells and bits together. It'll look like a giant mess. That'd be very cool. Um, the cool thing about it is that there are actually two sections of Spider. One section is protected by traditional security forces and, um, you know, operators and, and, and those sorts of things that are, that are paid for by the local residents. And there's the other section, which is protected by no one, but it's under a common defense agreement, which effectively means if you go there and you shoot somebody, you are free to murder by anybody else on there. So Good times. There's an entire section, which is where like all of the bars are, <laughs> <laughs> where where you can you can just go, like completely un, un, unknown. Sort of Found it. <laughs> Place this one's literally called Bar. <laughs> yeah. The spider is gonna be cool. I oh my gosh! By the time we have the spider, though, I mean this game is gonna be unrecognizable compared to what we have oh, yeah. now. Yeah, the spider is very, um, it's, it's, it's unique, but I don't think it'll, by the time spider comes in, by the time Cathcart comes in, the game will be completely on a level that we, we can't even imagine. Right it now. would either be yeah, a failure that's just hanging on or an absolute icon. And I mean, yeah. if it got that far, then I think it would be the latter. I forgot to mention as we go through this, that these, this map, anybody who's used it, it does have cool little filters if you want to see this isn't very good for it hold on let's go back to it's really good on stanton uh, here we go so you get these filters that show like where all the stuff is happening in the system where's the trade Crime and trade yeah yeah the threats where are the criminals so this is likely going to be something that we see on our own star map in the game sort of help yeah. you figure out where not to go Powered by Quanta, which is now officially going to be in the game in uh, 317. At least the game. Yeah. So. Pretty cool. All right. Yeah. 
Yeah, Cathcart, uh, I would I would say Cathcart is probably one of those places like Terra and Earth, like in Seoul, which is just probably not going to be in the game until much later, because it is one Oop. of those iconic, it, it is the pirate haven, like the pirate headquarters, so. Just forgot about this music. Okay. So we've got, we've got small, large, and medium jump points. Um, do you think they're going to redo all that? Yeah. I think they are. So for basic gist for both in-game and in lore, the classifications of small, medium, and large are not, they're not pinned down. But the, uh, the basic concept is a large jump point is so large that like four bangles can go through them side by Oof. side and still not take up the whole place. Large jump points are like the highways of Star Citizen. Everything, like, just traffic goes back and forth all over the place. Um, medium jump points, because the medium jump, there's a medium jump point between Pyro and Stanton, we know at the very least should probably be able to hold one ja uh, one Idris going between it. Um, probably a little bit bigger. And uh, then small jump points are, I think the biggest ship in a small jump point is a freelancer. A freelancer max is the biggest ship so they get they get they go down in size pretty quickly and you can see here that there are i mean there let's say there are some systems that hold on i think i'm doing this backwards there are some systems where if you get stuck inside of them with a big ship you can't get out, right? Like if you buy a big ship there or something. Yeah, I mean, I think I think they're likely going to make it so that large ships can go through medium jump points, but like one at a time. Right. But yeah, you're you're, you're like there. There'll there'll be an option. Um, and the, the kind of the way that this will work in kind of gameplay is that small jump points will will be more numerous, and they'll the work is shortcuts. So say you want to go to, uh, from you're, say you're in, um, say Nemo, and you want to go to uh, Lear. There may be ways that you can go from Nemo to Lear that utilizes small jump points, whereas someone in, say, a whole C will have to use larger jump points. So if you use several smaller ships, you'll be able to beat that whole C with the same amount of cargo than just going in a whole C. That's going to be, this is, oy, logistics. <laughs> I'm just, I'm still thinking about the cargo refactor. Yeah. I mean, this, we, we joked about how when Cathcart comes in the game, it'll be completely different. Like, the end of this year is going to be a completely different game. Yeah. The end of next year will be unrecognizable. The second they get any kind of multiple systems in game, logistics alone are going to be their own discipline that people are going to have to learn. Um, and, uh, uh, that's not my game. I don't do the spreadsheets well. <laughs> um, just having checklists is what it is. <laughs> All right, let's go to Ellis, my favorite system. Ellis, like Ellis. Thanks for the follows today, by the way, guys. Okay, Ellis has a holy crap! Ellis is so big. It's I huge. forgot about Pinecone out here. Oh yeah, Pinecone's. Uh, um, so Ellis um, is another one of those like central locations. Um, the probably the most famous planet on Ellis is Green, which is where the the uh, Murray Cup is held. So if you ever did the racing in Murray Cup, that's supposed to be on Green. So I have no pictures of Ellis. Ellis is like every planet, though, or at least not every planet, but oh. every planet in this like Green Belt here is just like paradise. Oh. Yeah, it's perfect. It's it's like the playground of billionaires. It's 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 where it's like the French Riviera is the best way of putting it. Uh, it's like it's like Cabo. It's where every, every all the rich people have like homes there, and everyone goes there for like like vacations and all sorts of things. So, and Ellis actually connects to Magnus, which I feel like is one of the earlier systems that we could get in the game. Um, oh yeah, being so it's, close I mean, to Stanton. It's literally got a jump point to Stanton. Yeah, and this one is where let's see, Drake is located, right? Is that Google? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's Google. It's like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Star Citizen, what? Uh, Get your wallet? Uh, yeah. Uh, Berea. Um, and uh, Newcastle is the capital. It's uh, it's where Drake Interplanetary is headquartered. Uh, <laughs> this is the picture features. used for <laughs> Drake Interplanetary's headquarters. Yep. Yep. That's Berea. It's Space Detroit. Effectively, the tragedy of Magnus is that Magnus was... Uh, once the headquarters of the UE Navy. It was where the UE Navy really, like, it's where they fought, like, the First and Second Tavaran Wars. It, it, it's, it was, like, it's where all the shipyards were that built all the major battleships and such. It was the place. And then they decided to move it to Kiel, where it is now. But in the process, Magnus got settled, but it was denied to be developed. So most of the people who lived in Magnus were relying on contracts that were connected directly to the UE Navy. So when the Navy left, they just kind of left everyone in the lurch. So nobody had any jobs anymore. <laughs> so the economy collapsed. And if it, uh, effectively, the only thing that was keeping them up was, uh, at one point, was Kruger. Kruger was one of the few companies that refused to leave after the after the Navy left. Huh. Um, and and they so they were they were building like parts for RSI ships, uh, but eventually, because you know, as the economy collapsed, crime rose, and as crime rose, it became more difficult to um, to protect trade routes in that area. And one particularly important um, shipment that was going to RSI got jumped by pirates, mm -hmm. and uh, Kruger was like, "Yeah, we got to leave." So, and, yeah. Uh, so. so Magnus is on the back up though because. Drake was founded in Magnus by people from Magnus, and they 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 were like, we're gonna we're sticking here, we're gonna build up Magnus back again, to make Magnus great again. So when when we get to see it, it's kind of like gonna be a reasonable place to live, you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm turning my mic a little bit because people are saying you need to turn it up. So oh. yeah, it'll 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 be it'll be like a less depressing Hurston, like Hurston without the bags. If that makes sense. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure this is working on my end. Um, Hurst, less depressing Hurston? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I can so, do that. No bags on so my like, head, like, that's cool. No, Like good air quality and no bags on your head. Cool, yeah. <laughs> All right, I, I, can, I can get with that. A lot, cool. a lot of empty warehouses, but you know. Well, Magnus is all right. That's where my org is based, at least in fiction. In fiction, that's where my character is from. That's where oh, I am from. Is perfect. Magnus, so. We can all be friends. Yeah. All right. The system that I know you believe will, well, uh, or at least has a good chance of being our third. Castra. Castra. All right. So we've got, we've got some pretty stuff to look at with Castra. Tell me a little bit about mm -hmm. this place and I'll, I'll pull up the goods. So Castra is a former military base. Uh, it's where the, uh, it has a outpost that was a military frontier outpost built because it was on or near the um oh what was it called um there was a uh a, a, effectively a border line between the Xi'an and the the, the Perry the, line the Perry line yeah um named after Admiral Perry who just who proposed it and uh Castro was not on the line it was like near the line but it was like like a secondary retreat base so um Castro was, uh, Cascom is what it was called, Ca uh, Castro Command, was the, um, the kind of like the hub of all of these defense fleets. So they built Sherman, which is uh, on the, it's beautiful, it's on the top of a mountain. Uh, it's like Denver, but like if Denver was in the Himalayas. <laughs> like, like you're landing on, 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 on this mountain, which is like, like, just like right above the clouds. Yeah, it looks really good. Um... And uh, over time, eventually, it got uh, decommissioned. The base eventually became less and less uh, popular and or less, less, less valuable as, as the Cold War, the Xi'an, cooled off or, uh, you know, tampered down. And they eventually decommissioned the base, but there are people who are still living there. So the um, local government effectively took the old base and kind of reused it for a bunch of things and, and managed to get more people to come in and uh, settle the area. So, especially because it's got a really great, beautiful vistas. And I think there's a company, I can't remember which company it is, that actually is headquartered in uh, in Castra. I want to say it's Castac Arms is now headquartered Ooh, in Castra. That'd be great. 
So, so. it's kind of like Stanton in the way that yeah. the UEE pulled out, but like there's still civilization and stuff going on. You th what, what do you think it'll be in terms of like, like crime-wise, safety and, and stuff like that? I think it'll be a heavy smuggler area because it's also right next to uh, Nyx. It's got a jump point to both Nyx and to Pyro. Okay. And it also has a jump point to um, Toe Hill, which is on the border between Xi'an and human space. So it's in this, it's this kind of like toe, toe foot. It's like the, the, the absolute extreme limit of the frontier uh, from, for the UEE perspective. Okay. So I expect it to be more wild than Stanton, but also more commerce-based. You know, you probably won't see as many like diehard criminals setting up spots, you know, in like old abandoned mines, but you will probably see a lot more smugglers and like pirate raiding groups that come in, hit and run out uh, because, you know, it's still a former UEE military base. They've, they still got a lot of defenses. Right, but, but maybe not entire yeah. javelins or Idris coming in owned yeah. by pirates. Yeah, but by the time we see multiple systems in game, I expect Stanton to be much more calm than it is now. You won't, you will probably won't have, you know, a javelin, which is uh, owned or, or operated in UE by around there. And you probably won't see like, yeah, like Xeno threat Idris is running around. Yeah. But you'll see like Corsair fleets, you know, that kind of thing. I like a Corsair or a fleet of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go to the new capital, the true capital, for those of us yes. who subscribe to the to the real truth. Terra forever. Terra uh, is a very important system. And I'm sure the lore never ends with it. So, I guess let's... I, I have to st I'll start with Project Farstar. Okay. Yeah, I was like, I don't know, even know where to start with this place. <laughs> so... Directly after humanity first started to explore the galaxy, uh, after the discovery of the first jump point, uh, there was a lot of early teething issues. The problem was, was that by the time the first jump point was discovered, humanity was still nation states. Um, there had been some amalgam, like the North American Union or North American Alliance existed, the Pan Pacific Alliance these kind of like EU type commerce slash political agreements that existed on Earth. Plus you also had like nations on Mars, in the belt, in Jupiter's moons, oh, you know, the solar system was becoming settled, but there was really no political unity. So when humanity started spreading out, we just kind of just went everywhere at once. <laughs> And no one really knew who had what jurisdiction over what, which eventually led to the U, uh, the UNE, the first human government. But part of that exploration, because it was became, now that we knew what to look for and we're looking for jump points, we began to find them everywhere. And every system we went to, we could find multiple jump points out ever, uh, to all different systems. Um, and um, one kind of almost accidental discovery of uh, what is, um, I believe it was... Orion was discovered by accident. And mm -hmm. it was such a huge deal because when they found Orion, it was the perfect. Armitage, which is the, the, the settlement on, on Orion, was this perfect location. It was barely needed any tweaking for environment. It was perfect for human habitation. Back when terraforming could take, you know, 50, 60 years, this thing required like two. And doesn't so look the, as good and, now, but. Yeah, well, uh, a lot of those places, early places in Armitage, uh, like Armitage, were uh, eventually became like literally in the crossroads of the Vanduul invasions. <laughs> but these are some of the oldest sites. So to give you some context in terms of like why the Vandal invasions are important is because where they're attacking is where humanity has been for the longest amount of time, like 600 years. Humanities had been, you know, um, settled in these systems and then the vandals come in and just wiped out these places it'd be like you know um like like orleans getting nuked off the face of the planet uh you know yes it's most people wouldn't really you know not everyone knows what orleans is but it would be big deal yeah <laughs> it's a huge yeah it's, it's a settled 
Like, you know, it'd it's be like, like Beijing disappearing. So many generations have lived there not knowing anything but peace. I mean, like, maybe not peace, but like, you know, normal life. Still. And then suddenly everything just gets destroyed. And it's basically longer than any of us know, you know, modern history. So that's, yeah, yeah that's a lot. That, um, that sucks, to put but, it lightly. It, because of the discovery of Orion and Armitage, and I think it's Orion and Armitage, is something one of these one of these planets. We see the um, the desire to really start to explore, but from a collective standpoint, rather than being individuals going off and exploring and stumbling into jump points, the UNE and then the UPE and eventually the UN uh, the UEE all decided to fund an initiative to help explore and chart new systems. And they called it Project Farstar. So these were government paid explorers who would go out looking for jump points and looking for planets to explore. And in this initial wave of investigation, they discovered Terra. And Terra 3, which is the which is what we call Terra. The star is called Terra, the planet is also called Terra. So it's confusing, but um, it was actually perfect. It was a Earth-like, required zero modifications whatsoever, and even had evidence of early uh, civilizations. There were like stone buildings that were abandoned. Um, the, no, no, one, no one knew what happened to that civilization. It, like those buildings had been abandoned, uh, you know, thousands, millions of years before humans showed up. And um, the thing that became important was that Terra was, didn't require terraforming, it was th two to three times the size of Earth. It was almost pristine in terms of human habitation, perfect human habitation, and was the like a nexus of like eight jump points. An insane amount of jump points. It is the crossroads of commerce. Yeah, there's like they're all right here too. Yeah. Wow. So uh Terra became the hub pretty much overnight because of its, you know, no one, you don't need to terraform it. You can just come because it was discovered by the UNE. It was government property. So it was effectively anybody who could pay the fee, like, which was cheap, like pennies to get land in these new places. Like by the time the, the information had gotten back to, uh, of the discovery of it to the UNE, by the time they were finishing up their, their exploration of the, uh, like, the system, there were already several settlement ships that were almost settled. They were already like <laughs> making their way to like that's how quickly people were like, we want to get there. Yeah, people were like, like screw you, points. screw your procedures. Yeah. <laughs> we're trying to land. I like um, what I love about Terra, at least Terra Prime, is the way that they have this whole like really kind of nice high end setup that they they talk about, and then they also have sort of these like lower kind of what do they call it the blocks. Mm -hmm. um they give this they give this place a really good vibe it's all obviously lore but mm -hmm. they are they're pretty good about sticking to the lore with landing zones not maybe with the scale but definitely with the idea this seems like a fun city oh yeah prime prime is very interesting because it's very it's almost classic cyberpunk the higher you go the higher the people are like like the more important people are <laughs> oh the lower i was you thinking go, a different high <laughs> yeah that too um but the, the whole the whole system is very like the whole the, the planet itself is very interesting because the whole the whole city vibe is very try to keep everything as uh, uh, like natural as possible. Mm -hmm. So even like in the bottom rungs, you'll probably have trees twisting and, and curling around um, around uh, buildings and, and grass and, and and all sorts of nature everywhere around the uh, place, like lots of water and uh it's it the the whole vibe of terra is supposed to be like what if we didn't screw up the earth <laughs> very like it's, what is, what do they call it civilization type three civilization or whatever it looks very yeah. kind of at least whenever i see the thumbnails for those videos it, it it's naturalistic yeah the concept is, is is that you're in harmony with nature rather than competition with it right and um that's why people from terra are super smug they're absolutely super smug because they're like <laughs> Like the, my favorite quote about Terra is uh, from a former Terran senator who said, if you want to know where humanity has been, go to Earth. Oh, boy. If you want to know where humanity is going, oh, go geez. to Terra. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Terra guy. Now I don't want to yeah. go there anymore. 
<laughs> but Terra's great. The Prime is, is like like the pinnacle example, but you also have um, New Kiev, um, which is um, where um, Anvil Aerospace is headquartered out of. You've got New Austin, which is where um, where Origin Jump Works is from. Or so unoriginal. Like, um, we named it Terra, but then we couldn't even come up with new city names either. <laughs> Um, gosh, there's, there's a couple of other places as well, like, like, but every place is like industry and, and, and innovation. Uh, Bering is actually in prime. Be the Bering uh, developed a, a new lab, a lab, uh, like a kind of R and D lab in Terra, uh, prime, uh, which they call the laser lab, but it's like every single new experimental technology that Bering comes up with is out of Bering. It comes out of uh, that lab. Hmm. So. I hope that that's in the game. I hope that uh, kind of like how we can do missions for Hurston. I'd love to be able to do a mission for Bering. I bet they have some cool exclusive guns or something. Oh yeah, they're very. Uh, uh, I mean, Bering also makes like coffee makers. <laughs> like, like probably most of the how? stuff that's in like those habs are just also Bering made. How does that happen? Well, I guess at this point the companies are so large they just make everything. They have different div divisions. The Bar right. Bering's division is. Uh, it's called a bearing applied uh, is what we see in terms of like weapons and armor. Okay. And um, regular bearing is like, I think the most famous thing that regular bearing makes is um, microwaves. Bearing food works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kanga, thank you so much for the sub, bringing your viewers over here. Welcome. Welcome aboard guys. We're just doing a little lore overview of the sweet, sweet systems of Star Citizen. And we were just looking at Terra. Uh I feel like, I feel like now we have to, you know, I, I see this question a lot, is Earth in the game? And yes. at this point, I feel like we have to do, we have to do the jump. Yeah. Can we go backwards though? I'm not doing the entire history of Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you guys can go find books for that. <laughs> but uh, the interesting thing about Earth is, and I've, I heard this, last, this, this a lot, which is what is Earth like in Star Citizen? And the answer is, have you ever lived in a city that's like medieval? You know, a, a, a place that still has castles from, you know, in, in say Japan, like 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 Kyoto, or or um, you know, live near the Great Wall of China, or live in near like you know famous palaces in India or old um, mosques in in Middle East. It's like, like the really are, old impressive stuff yeah like like lived in istanbul yeah you know like like if you've been to istanbul that's what it's like to live in earth it's 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 old everything is old and preserved and very few people really live there anymore it's like even uh like they have less population on earth in star citizen than there are on earth today it's like i think two to four billion people live on earth now Wow. Uh, in the Star Citizen universe. So it's very, so like you can imagine that at one point its population was 30 billion. Jeez. Or something close to that. So it grew dramatically and then they all left to go <laughs> out into the stars and then no one came back. Just ruined so, it and then dipped out. Yeah, effectively. So you've got a bunch of like historical monuments which have been preserved, but like, uh, like a lot of it is just not unused, but just old. I know I have some pictures of Earth. There's a lot of concept art for it, but I'm not uh, seeing any here. I think this is Beijing, I think it's supposed to be, which you're showing right now. Shanghai. There's all uh, Shanghai. And then there's, um, there's Moscow. Little, yeah, Moscow, London. Or is there London? There's Frankfurt. I'd be wrong about that. We got this. We could pull this up. There's some really cool, um, really cool stuff. So, like, when it comes to the lore, I don't know how many different pieces they've put out about um, Soul yet, but like, do we have any idea of what the, the star system is like? Like, is it dangerous? Is it abandoned or people all over the other planets? Yeah, the people all over the planets. Um, Mars is pretty big. It's a big industrial site. Um, the The main city on Mars is, I'm trying to look at what it's called, Port Renatus, which is the first city built outside of Earth. Um, and uh, it still has some of the original structures from its first habitation. It was basically a, like a, 
like a research facility and then eventually became a uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a settlement. Okay. The only planet that's not settled or doesn't have any human presence is, I believe, Venus. But I have a feeling that with the new information that's come out, they're probably going to go back and say that, you know, people are living in, like, say, the clouds of Venus or something like that. <laughs> but, yeah, that's early concept art right there. That's really early, like, first couple of, like, years, like, first year early in terms of Port Renatus. Jeez. Elijah McNeil's name is all over the concept art, mm -hmm. uh, the city stuff. Yeah, I think Elijah McNeil did a lot of work with, like, he did, like, the last, uh, uh, the the new Star Wars films. He's he's done those. He's done a bunch of other stuff like that, too, so. Yeah, Earth looks pretty cool. Yeah. Earth Earth is very different, uh, much more academic and political. It's bureaucratic. The people who live on Earth are bureaucrats. They're people who are part of the system, who work for the UEE, who... Uh, you know, go to school like Mo Moscow is a big, big place for um, interstellar um, linguistics and culture like the Moscow um, the University of Moscow. That's like or the University of Moscow, which actually has this. It's like where you if you want to learn like Vanduul, you go there. They have all of the information on Vanduul. They've huh. been doing extensive studies there. So. Um, but yeah, that's <laughs> you the voice for the New Deal. No, no. I know him. I've met him. <laughs> so, Paul, what's what's a system that you... What's your favorite system, actually? Other than Magnus? Um, Tamsa is my favorite system. Tamsa. All right. Tamsa. I'll explain why when we get there. Okay, there's Tanga. Tanga. Tams. Oh, there it is. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was just going to be a, <laughs> a black hole. It's a black hole. What is? Uh, there is one planet. There's it's a planet. A gas giant. Yeah. Where? There's a gas giant that that orbits oh. it. Is that it? Way out there? Yeah. Tamza two. I can't even. Oh my gosh. Oh, there we go. Now I can zoom out. Holy crap. Oh, it's two. There's two planets. Oh, Unless this I, is I a... think th th There's one of them is a gas giant. I think you can't zoom oh, okay. a gas giant. Um, it's Jeez. it has moons. It might be Tamsa too. It has a gas giant, but um, it has moons around it. It's got like four or five moons, and one of those moons is uh, possibly has life on it. Ooh. So. And they have um, the whole. They have the whole fair. What is it called? Fair. Fair chance act. Fair chance. Yeah. Is this yeah. under that? Or do they not yeah, actually? Know it was it, it was actually discovered by a Banu. Tamsa was discovered by a Banu. Huh. It was gifted to the UEE um, by the Banu. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, and the the uh, the the I believe the Banu was actually a the the, the Banu in question was a UEE citizen. Um, like he lived lived in the UEE, but because there was um, like his Suli that he was originally from had no jurisdiction over it and it was deep into human space. He's just like, eh, I'll just give it to the UE. So they made a big deal about it and <laughs> he didn't, we did a discussion, but, but because he discovered it, he got to name it. And he named it after uh, Tamsa, after Tamsa Wheel, who is this great artist who, um, who painted in logarithmic and mathematical formulas. She would take fat formulas and turn them, uh, math, math formulas and turn them into art. Hmm. Um, so she used like very like like geometric shapes and all these sorts of things that represent each of the formulas. Wow! And it was his favorite artist, so that's why he named it after her. That's uh, pretty cool. So, you know how big this system is? Oh, jeez, I don't know. Probably <laughs> like fourteen, fifteen AU. Let me look it up. Also, uh, where according to the, uh, oh. it's uh, three hundred and three AU. Okay, so is anybody even ever going to come out here? <laughs> like no. That, that's going to take so long to get to Tamza too. That's insane. There's only one uh there's only one other um system that's as big and that's Keel when it's only very, slightly bigger. Um, Holy crap. 315. And the the thing about about Keel is that there's only been one ship to ever make it to the outskirts of the Keel system. 
and that was one of the first Carricks. Okay, hold on. Now we got to see. It took them a long time. <laughs> kill, 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 kill. A there we go. I K E I L, I think. Yeah. So whoa, you got a few jump points. It's the headquarters of the UE Navy. The UE Armed Forces oh. are all headquartered out of, out of Kiel. So. And Kiel Six out here, I'm guessing, is the yeah is the one no one goes to. They, they still go to it. I think they call it Ice Ball or something like that. It's it's they use it for training. I think the Marines use it for training. Oh God, I'd hate that. Yeah, it sounds the, like the, the way it works. The where they send all the people who they don't like. Well, it's it basically you go out there. Like I think the way that that works is that they send you out there. They send the Marines out there for like survival training. They're like, here's a suit, here's a gun, don't die. <laughs> get back, get back to the center of the system. If you if you find your way back, uh, you, then then you deserve to be a marine. <laughs> and then you're uh, in. Good luck. We'll send you to the yeah. front lines. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Keel's pretty cool. Like like the Keel, I think Keel two or Keel three is like the actual headquarters. It's called MacArthur. Huh. Um, but there are there are several. There's like one planet which is not owned by the UEE in the Keel system. That is, uh, that has literally every single like manufacturer has a headquarters there. So like why? Anvil. And why uh, is all that stuff here? Because it's it's because it's um, if you look at where its location is, I believe it's on the border of uh, Xi'an space, or near the border of Xi'an space. Let's so. See. It was originally built there specifically to deal with uh, the threat of the of the Xi'an. Ah, uh, yeah, it's the next next one from mm -hmm. Baker. I guess Baker's got to be a pretty important system then. So, like, you can think of Keel as like the main center command. You can think of like Cascom as like one of the like procedural commands. Mm -hmm. Effectively, they have like one jump point away, one or two jump points away from. Um, from the border worlds, there were several planets that were settled as frontline bases. And Keel, I think, was like dead center in the middle of okay. the jump points. So it became the the place where they wanted to build. Um, whereas Magnus was just originally there because it was available. <laughs> and it was <laughs> sort of on the it was on the frontier at the time, but by the time the Keel system was developed, it was it was discovered and they had to, uh, you know, built the parry line you have mm -hmm. that had to build it there so hmm what's another good system um toe hill toe hill's a good system toe hill i also kind of like the name because it just i try to <laughs> picture a toe hill a hill made of toes or just one giant toe that looks like a hill i don't no, know toe hill is pretty cool because it's mostly empty but toe hill <laughs> Three or four um, is uh, is a water world where they have these floating plants, like effectively like flowers, just grow, and they grow into these big tangled messes and vines. So that you have these these little islands that are made out of plants that um, that uh, people live on. That is, um, people live on them like giant lily yeah. pads. Giant lily pads that people, they built a giant entire city on it. In fact, oh, man. Uh, they built, because it's outside of the UE, they kept building on it. And, and uh, some people were like, hey, maybe we should build on <laughs> fragile flowers. They're floating. And, so. Yeah. And they're like, nah, it's fine. And then like half the city collapsed into the water. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, yeah. So they stopped building after that. But um, uh, gosh, what is it? Uh, it? It was it was this big place for like tourism. In fact, uh, uh, that planet is the is where the peace accords between the Xi'an and humanity took place. It's where the emperor of the Xi'an met with one of the senators of humanity of huh. UE to discuss the peace treaty. Was that was at Toe Hill? So it's a so. pretty close to the Perry line as well. Yeah, it's it's one of those places where oh yeah, where it's got a jump point to the Xi'an systems and a jump point to human systems, but it was kind of awkward out in the middle. So, and it was, it had a jump point to Nyx. So it was like, do we, the humanity was like, we don't want to have to go into Nyx and conquer it to be able to deal with Toe Hill. And yeah, that would we'll be. Otherwise we'll have to go through it. And it's just a mess. So they just stayed back at, uh, at uh, Castra. 
But uh, it, Toe Hill is actually the like the first place where, outside of first contact to contact and very tense negotiations between political leaders, mm-hmm. is where the Xi'an and humanity first met in person. Like Xi'an smugglers met hum- human smugglers in Toe Hill. Right, which is how, I think. Like, Xi- like Jean Tech began to come into the United into the United States into into the UAE and then <laughs> human tech started making its way into Jean space. Yeah, I think so. I remember hearing about that. I see in chat you guys talking about um Squadron 42 system. So if you look at where we are here at Stanton, in fact we can actually do a pretty do this pretty easily. Stanton to okay. Apparently I'm wrong on Keel. It's, I'm talking about Killian, not Keel. As the center? Uh, as the as the the head of the UEE, I see. So they don't send Marines way out to that <laughs> to that planet. Uh, no, but there is there is a planet like that. Yeah, so I, I got the screw, screwed up. Okay, I always get those two confused because the K's. So Killian we've also got... has one of those though, because it's it's 194 AU. <laughs> with Killian system. Oh my gosh, what is Stanton again? It's like seven. Uh, three. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to fly anywhere. Okay, so Stanton is where we are in game right now. Mm-hmm. And Pyro is the next system. Mm-hmm. And then after Pyro, we had kind of we already know we're getting Nyx right after Pyro. So like, there's a pretty yeah. clear progression going on here. And then the campaign, the Squadron 42, takes place at There's the end of that here in Odin. Mm-hmm. So let's hop in there. Oh, I forgot they do that. Odin's pretty cool. Odin is technically UEE, but you would be hard to, you'd be hard pressed because no, no, none of the UEE actually goes there. Um, what, what is the significance of Odin? Uh, it has the coil, which is uh, like Keel, or Keel, I keep calling back Keel. It's Odin one. It's one of the Odin's planets that yeah. exploded. Is that, but like, significance in terms of why would the UEE care about Odin? Because the coil took an entire planet full of resources and blew it into tiny chunks. Mm. So you have, a, okay, a, yeah. you know, you, you basically if you took, say, Earth, like, like there's plenty of resources in Earth that are way deep down in the, like, the, the core or, like, at the very, so deep that it would be impossible or, like, pretty much... Um, uneconomic to reach because mm-hmm. it would just cost too many too much yeah. resources to get them out in the first place yeah think about that but like then explode the earth into tiny chunks it'd be much easier to get a lot of those resources because they're now just floating everywhere that's fair that's so so um i believe um what's the mining company Shubin. So the mining company that's over Shubin, yeah Shubin has a full-on like mobile space station that they brought right. into the coil to mine the coil for resources. So in the middle of the, you know, Vanduul War, you need resources, especially mm-hmm. to build all these new ships and all that kind of stuff. So the coil is very important for that. And that's, that's uh, a lot of Squadron 42 takes place around that mining facility, right? Yeah. It's, you have to go it's, into the coil. It's the main focus and the Odin itself. Um, and the main uh, antagonists of uh, Squadron 42 are the OMC the Odin Munitions Corporation, which was a legitimate business making weapons. Uh, and then a revolt happened of the workers and they replaced the, the leader with this um, mysterious uh, leader named Sato Khan. Ah, no one knows who he is. Sato Khan. Is that your leader? Am I supposed to be scared or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so this guy... Sato Khan, they decided that they should take their company over and put this mysterious dude in in charge of it. Um, so that's that's all kind of recent. Like the whole point of uh, the UEE being in Odin and doing all this fighting, that's all recent stuff as far as Squadron 42 is concerned. It's not like some historical yeah. war or something going on. Yeah, I don't know how recent it was that the that OMC got turned into a kind of a, a, a rebel organization, mm-hmm. but it was it's recent enough that uh, I think it's recent enough in the sense that it, they're they're raiding the Shubin mining um, facility. Right. Okay. So, like, the UEE is being sent in to just deal with the problem. Gotcha. Because, again, resources. 
And so. from what we've seen of the vertical slice, it seems like that's kind of the the sort of opening incentive of being there. And then the story, I, I'm assuming, expands from that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you also can see about it like a lot of other things because it's near it's near Van Duel space because I think Virgil is nearby it. Um, it's near Nyx, so it's near a bunch of other hostile spaces, and like, like, and of course, Nyx has got a jump point to Pyro, so you've got like lots of criminal elements that go through there. It's yeah. close to where where the Xi'an space is as well, so you've got this kind of intersection of all these different groups right around Odin, which is why they chose to make Odin put Odin there in the first place because it kind of has all of those elements hmm. mel melted together. So okay, talking more about this whole map that we're in. So I know that the by the way, hmm? this this won an award. This map won an award. Really? Yeah, it won, like a website design award. Oh well, I mean it's pretty like cool. Stuff. It's pretty yeah. cool. Hello, Mrs. Tomato. Thank you for joining us. Shaka Khan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> OMC is being run by Shaka Khan. <laughs> okay, so this map, the Vandal are known as being uh, nomadic, right? Mm-hmm. So when they mark these these systems as being Van Duel, is that just to say that's where people have found them? In some cases, um, the thing is, is that because they're nomadic, they, that doesn't mean that they just kind of hang around or they just like keep moving. It means that they stay in an area and then they just harvest an entire planet or system for resources. Okay. So Van Duel could be in a system for a day or they could be in a system for a hundred years. Depends on how long and what uh, the, the depends on the clan, depends on what they need, and the clans will fight each other all the time. So, like for instance, we know that Orion, which was the first system to fall to the Vanduul, mm -hmm. has humans on it. Humans live in Armitage still. Yeah, the planet has been stripped of resources, but humans still live there. It's just there's a lot of Vanduul still in the region because they use it to go between you know various locations and raid human space. So. Yeah. So, and you can come out here, right? I, I know uh, yeah. I've talked to Morphologist a couple of times. That's like his org's end game kind of goal is to make the journey all the way out here, which is freaking far. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. There are a lot of dangers too, because you also got to go through, um, oh gosh, a couple of different red systems, including one system, which is called the Grinder. Um, Sounds like a good name. It's called the grinder, and not for good reasons. Uh, <laughs> not not for the fun grinder way. Not because there's cracked uh, black pepper everywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, what is it? What is it called? Um, I wouldn't want to go to a system called Vulture, to be honest. Uh, Caliban, I believe. Oh, Caliban. Yeah. Could be Caliban. I think it may be either either it's either Caliban or um, Tiber. I think it's Tiber. Tiber is is, is the is the grinder. Uh, Tiber. Ooh, it's a lot of jump points. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, it's called the grinder. Uh, it's it's the battle for uh, for Tiber was this long, excruciating experience. It took years. And in, is where we we know at least canonically the first use of antimatter weaponry against the, the Vanduul. Like they, the, the Vanduul eventually just basically took one of the planets, and um, in order to dislodge the Vanduul from like human settlements that they were occupying, the navy would just fly in bombers and just hit hit the these cities with antimatter weapons. Which, if anybody knows what an antimatter weapon does, it's like it's something like a hundred times worse than a hydrogen bomb. Not so, good things. Yeah, like it it scorched earth. Like nothing survives that. So um but it's called the grinder because every so often the UEE will send in forces into the into there to kind of try to clear out the Van Duel and very few come back. Jeez. Because they just get chewed up. Grinded, if you will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, like, going to get to Orion, you gotta go through Tiber, and Tiber is nightmare fuel <laughs> man how long is it how <laughs> i mean Dancing? people always talk about like oh we're never gonna get 100 systems even you know even if even if you were gonna draw a straight line from stanton to tiber that would still just take such a long time yeah there's so many systems 
it's also important to remember like that a lot of these systems are also fairly empty. True. Um, like, like look at Nemo. Nemo is a great example of this. Nemo. Nemo, believe, Nemo has, I believe one settlement on it. It's a, it's a fair chance protected act. I believe. Uh, Ergo. Yeah. Ergo is the, is the main planet. Ooh, ocean world. They live on, uh, um, on a, um, um, in in the uh, on a city that's on the ocean, which is uh, on some ice caps. That's so. pretty cool. Buoyancy it's tech. Where... Mm -hmm. Um, and it's um, uh, uh, it's got this. It's got space whale, which is actually a giant uh, asteroid that's in the <laughs> it's in the orbit of Ergo. Huh. Uh, but like that's it. Like it's just got Ergo, which is just a city on a on a on a on an ocean world. So like most of the planets are like Ergo or like Tamsa or like uh, Banshee, which are just they're cool in their own little ways. They got their own little things. But yeah. there's like you know two or three planets, mostly just non-existent. No one really lives there, and then like one landing zone. So, true. True. So while while it seems like oh it's gonna take so long, it's like well. It depends on how long the, the real slowdown is going to be. How well do they build these uh, these uh, landing zones? That's really yeah. the issue. I also, I also do hope that even though we're playing the same game systems and missions and stuff, they keep up with keeping new kinds of. You know, you don't want to play the same sort of mission in Stanton as you do in Bremen, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, Bremen. I would say Bremen is my second favorite system, by the way. Really? I love Bremen. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's Space Show Texas, Bremen. baby. Oh, gosh. Space Texas. <laughs> all right. How so? Okay. So, got, like, cows? first of all, yes, it's, 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 um, Bremen is the breadbasket of the UEE. Um, pretty much up until very recently, pretty much all of, uh, food in the UEE was grown on Bremen. On, um, Gosh, what's the, what's the the the, the name? Ritif. Ritif, yeah. Ritif. And um, Ritif, um, like a, originally, the main food producing company on Ritif was known as um, Bremen Mills, but after the I think the Second Foreign War, they kind of ran into hard times, so a company. On Terra purchased them and they changed the name from Bremen Mills to Terra Mills. And Terra Mills is like the company that makes Big Bennies, they make all the food bars. I was gonna say make, it just makes uh, me think of cereal. General Mills. Yeah, yeah, General Mills. Yeah. Um, so like they've been like this big farmland forever. And why it's also Space Texas is because Consolidated Outland is from there. Ah. We all know who the head of Consolidated Outland is. What's his name? Silas Kern. Silas, that's Mr. right. Mr. Mr. Elon Musk meets, um, oh gosh, uh, what's his name? I always blank on his name. Um, the actor. Yeah. Um, uh, I, from Interstellar? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of uh, <laughs> What's his name? Yeah, him. Ethan, uh, no. Ethan, no. no, not Ethan Hawke. Um <laughs> Chat will is delayed, so they'll, they'll tell us here in a moment. I can't remember. Yeah, somebody get us, help us. Chat. Somebody's screaming at the screen right now. So someone's screaming at the screen. Matt Damon. <laughs> Matt, Matt Damon. Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. Matthew McConaughey. That's right. And for those of you who don't know, Matthew McConaughey is from Texas. So like he's got that kind of you know Texas vibe. <laughs> and um, he runs through cornfields, chasing drones and traveling through dimensions. Yes. Um, the science Carter is like a rich kid his his family the kerners were like the original founding family of of bremen uh, but bremen's also the headquarters of the bremen defense force which is the best militia in the universe um they're so good that companies literally make ships for them that then get pr produced everywhere else like the super hornet was built for the bremen defense force and then they sold it to the rest of the people. So they, they, they so <sighs> that Anvil could say, yeah, the Bremen Defense Force uses this this ship. You should too. Thank you, Bremen Sabres, Defense Force. Yeah, the Saber was also built for the same reason. And even the um, the the Scorpius, it's coming out soon. That was also built for the Bremen Defense oh, Force. Oh, thank so, you. Thank you, guys. So yeah, so the Bremen Defense Force is is this fan, like 
fantastic vo volunteer militia that are also super good at what they do. They're so good that the advocacy kind of defers to them for, for security purposes. Wow. Um, <laughs> fa famously, uh, there's the advocacy uh, in agent in charge of Bremen um, was, um, uh, I forgot his name, but he, he famously swapped out his Avenger from a stalker, which is the one that has all the prisoner pods, to a Titan. And he called his ship the Renegade. Um, and people thought, the, the criminals thought that he, he pulled the, 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 the pods out because he didn't take prisoners. Um, reality was, was that he just let the Bremen Defense Force, he just called for the Bremen Defense Force. They'd come up and, like, if, if he caught somebody, they'd come in and pick him up because they, were, <laughs> they had the facilities. Just but easier. The, the criminals... The criminals didn't know that, so they just thought that he, this dude was absolutely insane. He just killed everyone, other than so like like people were too afraid to try to stop him to to, to fight him, um, which is where we get the um, the uh, Aegis Titan Renegade. Yeah, that's that's his uh, that's okay. model after his ship. It's so a good strategy. Piece of German. Yeah, people don't actually, leave me alone like that when I fly that ship. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, the real reason he pulled out those pods was because. He was dealing with smugglers because Bremen is the headquarters for most smuggling rings because it's on the uh, the path. It's on a great. It has a great kind of jump path, which can avoid a lot of UEE uh, speculation hmm. from the center of UEE because Bremen, I think, is like one or two jump points away from Terra, all the way to Xi'an space. And in the during the time of the Mezers, uh, Bremen was it was called it's called the Bremen Beltway. If you wanted to escape the Mezers, you would go to Bremen, you'd get the right contact, and it was kind of like an underground, the Underground Railroad. You would get into this the, the smugglers, and the smugglers would smuggle you out of the system and into Xi'an space through Bremen. And right. the Bremen Defense Force famously actually paid off, or actually paid off, was actually uh, like working with the smugglers to, 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 to get people out so that they would, you know, because, you know, they didn't like the... the, the um, the measures either yeah we so. talked about this in your last lore podcast yeah 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 the one we talked about check that out over on his channel youtube.com slash the astro pub um or citizen <laughs> and okay so why why was why was the bremen defense force so good so the thing about bremen is that even though it's kind of remote or it just gives it's important it's it's more remote it's not really a lot of trade that goes through it. Mm -hmm. So the people of Raitif had a lot of money and because they're farmers, they had, you know, they, they weren't needed. actively like it, it, being a farmer in the 30th century is not exactly the same thing as farmers today. There's <laughs> a lot of time on your hands because you have systems you build to, to help monitor everything. Right. So, um, and anyone who's lived in the country long enough knows that if you get a bunch of bored farmers together, at some point, guns are coming out. And someone's <laughs> going to shoot a can. Um, either booze or guns are coming out. Uh, so you had a lot of people who had a lot of money, who had a lot of time, and had a lot of interests in that sort of that sort of range. And you had a lot of smugglers who were trying to use the fact that it was kind of off the off the beaten path to try to, you know, move things around. So it became kind of like this frontier justice sort of thing. And eventually the Bremen Defense Force became so good, they could just ignore the UEE. And so they became this sort of this weird pocket where like, yeah, they're part of the UEE, but they could just ignore everything the UEE says and just do what they wanted to because they didn't even <laughs> need the army. They had their own. That's so, pretty cool. Um, it's actually the basis for, for, the, for the civilian defense force is, is the Bremen. Uh, Bremen de uh, Defense Force. So the CDF is based off of the Bremen Defense Force. The whole concept of using contracts to hire people to kind of go out and do stuff for them. So, mm -hmm. Dude, where, where, how have you learned all of this? Just reading on the website and stuff. I, I have a brain that doesn't work properly, <laughs> and it, it absorbs it absorbs information like this because you know it's similar to history, and my brain like, oh, this is history. Let me learn. And Makes sense. Yeah, uh, but yeah, mostly through reading through the website, so. Because, I mean, if you think about, I, I keep thinking about how it's kind of disappointing that there's so much lore, but we don't get to really experience it that much. And then I think about mm -hmm. all the other things that I like the lore of, and I'm like, I don't get to experience any of that either. And then I get to the point where I'm like, well, there's, there is so much lore in this. I mean, we're not even, the game hasn't launched. 20 years from now, we could be actually living this lore, but there's just a, a lot to learn. 
and mm -hmm. they've put a lot of thought into the systems and why they're there. Yeah, I mean, everything's designed to be built. The, the thing that makes Star Citizen different from other 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 kind of uh, game companies and other other groups out there that do with like extended universes is that from the beginning, Star Citizen was being built as a living, breathing universe rather than being um, the background for a tabletop game or for a movie series. Mm -hmm. It was designed that you would eventually have to interact with this. So the people, the organizations, the locations, they had to be believable in a, in a way that you could understand that there are multiple people who live there. You couldn't have, you know, like like in Star Citizen, you could never have the the light side and the dark side. You know, you couldn't really have the Covenant and the and the UNSC. You can't have these sort of these big bold dichotomies where it's like, oh yeah, of course, I, of course you're going to fight with as the Master Chief because the Covenant are trying to exterminate humanity. That's obviously bad. <laughs> Not great, um, yeah. Uh, but in, in Star Citizen, like you do have a little bit of that with things like the Van Duel, mm -hmm. but most places have to have a little bit of shades of gray. You got to have the, like, yeah, these people are extremists. They think that the, the government is corrupt and they're right, but they also are well, like, aliens have infected everything. We need to kill, we need to kill all the aliens. You're like, whoa, okay, this is, this is some weird stuff going on. But then on the other side, you've got people who are like, you know, yeah, let's let's try to incorporate aliens into our society. Let's let's try to bring in more people. Let's try to be more accepting. Let's get more. It's like ah, that's great. Like, and let's try to make peace with the Van Duels. Like, yeah, the Van Duel will eat my liver for fun. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, maybe not that far. So so the like the universe itself is crafted in a way that players can hop in and interact with and choose like people and organizations and make decisions that would make it they make the universe change so the universe can't be in black and white mostly it has to yeah. be this sort of fluctuating gray zone where players get to go in and interact with it and so as a result the lore is very believable very interconnected and uh very in depth to give that sort of foundation right uh, the problem is it's just we just don't have the game yet yeah <laughs> so it doesn't interact with it yet and and you can't you can't get too deep into it until you do have the game because you kind of got to stick to what the game can also do. So I'm always yeah. I'm always just like, I want to know more stories. And the big thing about it as well is they don't want to give answers. Unlike, say, uh, let's just use Warhammer 40K. The game, I like Warhammer 40K. It's a big popular. Yeah. Like there are you, people who know that the lore of that know who the emperor is, know about the Horus Heresy know about like the black crusades know about the expansions of the of the tau know about the the high fleets and all these sorts of things where they mm -hmm. have beginning middles and ends beginning middles and ends they have a story that leads up to it and every couple of years a new story comes out and they have you know they have books or they have they have campaigns that you can play or they have, they have video games whatever yeah star citizen can never have an ending so unlike star wars where you know, you know, at the end of The Empire Strikes Back, you know, you know, spoiler, uh, Darth <laughs> Vader is Luke's father. Plug um, your ears. <laughs> you, you can't have that moment in Star Citizen until players get a chance to make that decision. Right. And even then, it has to open up for more gameplay opportunities because it's a game. It's got to keep going. So... It, it's almost unsatisfactory. It's, it's like, un, like, you have all these cool things like... Uh, synth world um you know project archangel is an artificial planet from from beginning to end that they're trying to build which system is that in by the way uh that is in the chronos system take a look at it chronos chronos and they did not want to make this one easy to find I think it's like CK. Let me look it up. There it is. All the way out here. Yeah, there's there's Synth World. Oh, I didn't know there were other planets in the system. Mm-hmm. So yeah, this is a is it's not a Dyson sphere, right? This is like an actual just yeah. physical the artificial way world. I, the way that I, I I can understand it, the way it's been depicted, is that it's uh, you know sh the shield worlds in Halo? 
the like the, the yeah. one in Halo Four where it's yeah. like a planet inside of a planet, it's like an onion planet. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's kind of what what the synth world is. It's like a planet huh. being built from the scratch, from the core outwards, to be just one gigantic planet with each huh. ring or each section being its own, um, you know, habitable planet. So it would be effectively like having instead of you know a normal planet where you only have the surface you can work with you can mm -hmm. use every single single like part every little part of the uh, planet to make it work um so it allows for much more populations much more control uh the problem is is that it keeps blowing itself apart <laughs> because it's so big that it's just hard to keep it together yeah, planets are not easy to make no um Fun part is, is that the Kronos system is actually connected to the Branagh system. And the Branagh system is the largest um, collection of uh, Tavarin outside of the UE. Huh. You know, I realized I've been looking for this Tavarin lore for the longest time. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it to you, but if, if there's anybody who would know, it's probably you. There was a... Mm -hmm. A lore piece about a Tavarin who returned returned to a planet where there was a ritual going on and it was like their first time seeing it and they kind of just were getting involved. It was like a holiday for the Tavarin. You does that ring any bells? It might be um uh Instrument of Surrender. Uh, which was a story series about the end of the Second Tavarin War. One of the main characters in that story is a Tavarin, and he mentions a little bit about him growing up in the Null system as kind of like a refugee, and then how he, you know, when, when the Second Tavarin War started, he joined the Tavarin forces because he felt like he had purpose. Uh, it could be a, s a system from the Branagh system or from the Elysium system as well, which is the the, the home world of the, the Tavarin. So. All right, I'll have to read that and see because it was good and it stuck with me, but I can't find it anywhere. It probably instrument of surrender. I think that's that's usually where that's the only story I know that directly references Tavarin. Okay. So. Well, um, I know you've got a stream coming on after this, right? Yeah. Cool. So. This has been a good look into some lore. I, I like these, I'd like to do. I wanna start doing more of these on Fridays, just kind of casual get togethers with other people and either getting in the game or doing some of this lore stuff. But thanks for coming yeah. to this one, dude. No problem. Let me know when, if you want to come back. I'm always, I'm always cool to talk lore, just talk shop. <laughs> Definitely. So are you uh, are you getting on right away? Cause I can pass everybody on over to you for some, some more. Yeah. Yeah, I can get started here in a moment. So. All right, cool. Well then I will, uh, I'll catch you later. And I'll go ahead and get everybody on over to you when you get live. Later. See ya.